As I get started this morning, I have a few things to say uh, just for us here as a family. First of all, um, I wanted to uh, make sure everybody here knows a lot of our college students are going to be hitting the road this Wednesday because there's a fall break Thursday and Friday. So we're going to miss you guys. Hope you all have a wonderful time. Look forward to having you back. We won't have college class on Wednesday night because so many students are going to be gone, but look forward to studying with you again a week from today. <clears throat> Speaking of our college class, I wanted to thank Andrew Hall very much for his willingness to speak this morning <clears throat> and to present us some very insightful thoughts about the two kinds of death that Jesus came to deal with, the death of our body and also the death of our relationship with God. As you can imagine, <clears throat> the last few weeks have uh, had a little bit of an extra workload, and uh, I just told the elders I need to have some help, and there were some people who were willing to step up, and Andrew was one of them, and our good brother Ralph is going to do the table talk uh, next week, and it really uh, helps me uh, tremendously, and it's good for us. It's good for us to hear from different people. It's good for us to develop the talent that we have here, and always good to come together around the table <coughs> and to put our minds into the Word of God. <coughs> Speaking of increased workload, um, I know that we have great appreciation for Patty Martin, Martin and all that she does for families who are going through loss, but uh, she is uh, an absolute treasure for us as a congregation. And so many of us have personally benefited from her love and her care. And she has been extraordinarily busy, as you can imagine. So if you haven't done so in a while, if you happen to, to uh, see Patty this morning, or maybe you can send her a text or an email, but just let her know how much we appreciate her and how, how blessed we are to have someone at such a vulnerable point in your life who is a sister in Christ who can be there and give us the kind of love that is especially the kind of love that you can receive from a sister. Well, this morning I want to wrap up a series I've been doing with you over the last couple of months on the topic of marriage. I want you to know um, I really appreciate all of the encouragement that you've given me during this series. Uh, not every time after I preach on this topic do I receive uh, comments that are entirely uh, uplifting or reassuring. I remember once when I talked about the difficulties of marriage that after that sermon, the wife in a, a veteran marriage, let's just say, came up to me after the lesson and said, I have to disagree with you. Marriage has not been hard at all. And a few minutes later, her husband came up to me and said, I have to tell you marriage is the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> so I was going to have to leave that to them to sort out, you know. But uh, that's an illustration of why marriage is difficult, because uh, it's no great shock that a husband and wife uh, may see things, uh, see things very differently, even a couple that's been together for decades. But as I've tried to emphasize in this series, for us as Christians, we understand that marriage is a model of the gospel. And the work of reconciling sinners, which is what the gospel is about, is also what marriage is about. And it makes it hard, and it makes it challenging. But by God's grace and by God's help, we can do it. So what I want to do this morning is just conclude with a lesson that I, that I hope will be a very practical lesson. And I want to build off of a passage everybody hears No, I'm not sure really even why I bothered to put it up on the slide here. Everybody knows John 3.16. If you're going to watch some games today, you'll most likely see some reference to this verse somewhere on the field or in the stands this afternoon. What this verse, though, tells us is something quite profound about the nature of God's love. It tells us, first of all, that God's love means that God gives. God so loved the world that he gave. And it also tells us that when God gives, he gives supremely. He gives sacrificially. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And it tells us that God so loved the world that he gave his son to meet our deepest need, that whoever believes in him would not perish, 
but have everlasting life. So love that looks like the love of God is love that gives and love that gives sacrificially and love that gives sacrificially to meet the needs of other people. So I want to take this principle and apply it to our relationships, first of all, in marriage. But as we just finished uh, emphasizing in the third quarter, we also have relationships with each other that we want to be healthy. And so whether you're single or married, the principles I'm going to talk about today are principles that should be applied to all relationships. I just especially this morning have the marriage relationship in mind. And I want you to turn with me this morning to 1 Corinthians 7 to set a foundation for what we're going to talk about. I also want to say this. I'm going to be thinking of our beloved brother, Patty, and Kylie all through this sermon. I'm going to say more about him as a husband in the eulogy tonight. But I felt like I just should put that out on the table as we are all together this morning. Because when you all shared with me your memories about Patty and the things that you admired him so much, at the top of everybody's list was the kind of husband that he was. And so I just want you to know that's going to be spinning in the back of my mind during this, this whole lesson. And uh, Nathan and Luke and all the family uh, were very, uh, very honored to share in the things we're going to share in this evening with you. We want you all to know how much we love you. All right, so in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul is answering questions the Corinthians have sent to him about various issues. That's why when he says, like in verse 1, now concerning the matters about which you wrote, he's responding to their inquiries. And the first thing he deals with is something that seems unusual to us. In my Bible, in verse 1, in quotation marks, we have this sentence, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. And most of the time in our Bibles, when they put a quotation mark in like that, what they are suggesting is that is what they ask him about. That's something that was a part of their letter that Paul is responding to. And if that is the case, then what it means is there were apparently some people at Corinth who thought that even when a man and woman are married to each other, they should remain celibate. And you may wonder, why would people think that? But on the other hand, if you consider in our culture people generally take one of two extremes when it comes to sex. Either on the one hand, they treat it as if it is a God, which some of the Corinthians did according to the previous chapter when Paul talks about idolatry and fornication. Or on the other hand, some people go the completely opposite extreme and want to shy away from the subject altogether as if somehow it's contaminated. And that may have been what was at work here among the Corinthians. And so Paul answers this question by saying this in verse 3. The husband should give to his wife. Now, the ESV says her conjugal rights. That's not ever going to make it on a Valentine's Day card, is it? You know? So it's, it's not exactly a phrase that uh, you know, really evokes romance. And likewise, the wife, her husband. The New American Standard says fulfill his duty, which I don't think really improves the situation. I do love the New King James Version says render due affection. And that's what Paul is getting at here, that when you are married, you are one flesh, and so therefore, your body doesn't belong to you, it belongs to your spouse, and vice versa. And the point is that I am to be so consumed with serving my spouse and showing affection to my spouse that it is as if my body does not even belong to me anymore. That's why I would often, when Christy and I were married, just simply go to her and say, baby, this is all yours. And she was just so ecstatic about that. Poor woman. I know you all still pray for the poor things that she had to go through in our life. So Paul wants husbands and wives to know you are to have this kind of affectionate and intimate relationship. And then he deals with the broader issue of singleness. And he says this in verse 8, To the unmarried and the widows, I say, it is good for them to remain single as I am which seems very odd in light of the overwhelmingly positive view of marriage found in the Bible. 
I started this series out by talking with you about how marriage is a model of the gospel. And then I looked with you in Genesis chapter 2 about the gift of marriage as God has built it. In fact, Paul himself in 1 Timothy says that those who deny marriage are preaching a doctrine of demons. So in light of all of that, what are we to make of this statement here in 1 Corinthians 7 and verse 8 that it is good for someone to remain single? Well, there must be then some qualifying circumstance that in this case has Paul give different instruction. And it is the case. Look down to verse 26. He says, I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. The reason that Paul prefers singleness in this context is because of the present distress that is going to tax the Corinthians and add to, to add to an already tenuous situation, all of the rigors of married life could be overwhelming to them. What I want to focus on with you, though, is the way Paul makes that point. If you skip down to verse 32, I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. What I want to focus on here is the phrase, pleasing your wife and pleasing your husband. Paul says, in light of the circumstances going on, it may be too much for you to have to worry about pleasing the Lord and also take care of your responsibilities as a husband or wife. He doesn't forbid it. He just says it would be easier in this regard. What I want us, though, to see is that according to Paul, it is a fundamental responsibility of husbands and wives to please their spouses. So, here is the sermon this morning. Point number one, Paul says, you are to please your spouse. You can understand then that those instructions he gave in the opening verses about the issue of sexual intimacy and in marriage are really just one small aspect of a much larger point that Paul is making in this passage, which is that it is the responsibility of a husband and wife to please their spouse. If you're not married, you don't have that responsibility. You just focus on the Lord. But if you are married, in addition to pleasing the Lord, Paul says, it is your responsibility to please your spouse. But if we are to please our spouse, then we have to know what will please them. And what will please them is to meet their needs. One of the biggest mistakes we can make in marriage is when we think we're doing something to please our spouse, but really what we are doing is something to please ourselves. And this, of course, is a point that if you'll go with me to Philippians chapter 2 or look with me on the screen, this is the very point Paul is raising that is true of all of us as Christians, that we are to be focused not simply on our own needs and wants, but on meeting the needs of others. Paul says, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. And of course, this doesn't change just because somebody puts a ring on your finger. This is how all Christians are to treat each other. But if all Christians are to treat each other in this way, then it is especially incumbent upon those who are married to each other to treat themselves with a commitment to see the needs that someone has and to try to meet them. One of the most helpful illustrations that I found when I was married to Christy to help me think about what it is to truly meet her needs is to think about a relationship as if it is like a bank account. Some of you have probably seen this illustration, an emotional bank account. I don't even know, do kids today even have piggy banks? Any of you people over here have a piggy bank? Okay, very good. So this is still relevant. That's fantastic. I'm always on the cutting edge here. Yeah, so let's think about an emotional bank account. <clears throat> Imagine how complicated our economy would be if all of us 
used a different currency? Well, emotionally, we all do. And what that means is then that if I want to create value in your life, then I have to make a deposit in your bank account with the currency that's valuable to you. And you have to do the same thing for me. So, for example, some of you uh, love conversation. You love to sit and talk. You like to have deep conversations. And that's the kind of thing that has great value to you. Others of you may find that what really has value to you is physical affection, lots of touching and hugging and physical intimacy. Some of you, it may be something that's more visual, like maybe someone who does kind things for you, or someone who does chores for you, or someone who gives you flowers or jewelry. Mrs. Scott had a particular fondness for that kind of stuff. Uh, which put a lot of pressure on someone whose idea of gift giving in the past had been going to Cracker Barrel on Christmas Eve, eating supper, going outside into the shop area, finding what was 75% off, buying that and having them wrap it. That was gift giving in my life until I met Christy, and then I had to really up my game. The point is, that kind of thing doesn't really have a lot of value to me, but if I'm thinking about pleasing her, if I'm thinking about meeting her needs, I have to think in terms of what will be meaningful to her. Remember, love gives and love gives to meet needs. And so if we are going to work to please our spouse, then we need to give them that which truly has value to them, that which truly helps to meet their needs. And on the other hand, the same is true, by the way, with withdrawals. Uh, some of you, like me, are very sensitive to tone of voice. Others of you, makes no difference whatsoever. But what happens is, if you speak to someone in a way that to them is harsh, then that's going to create a huge debit out of the account, even though it never even occurred to you that that would be the case. Some of us like to tease. That's one of our forms of affection. And many times in my life, I found out not everybody thinks I'm just such a clever fellow. And quite often in my effort to be affectionate, I've been rude and I've hurt people's feelings and I've had to make apologies or else I would put the relationship in the draw. So you all see the idea here of how this works. This idea of an emotional bank account is just a simple way to apply in practical terms what Paul said in Philippians 2, looking to the interests of others. Or what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 about being the kind of person who is truly interested in pleasing your spouse. Here is the reason why, and we've all seen this, that you will learn that a couple that has been married for years divorces. And you wonder, how could that possibly happen? This explains how that happens. What's happened is, over the course of years, there have been withdrawal after withdrawal after withdrawal. And there have not been deposits of things that that person needs. And eventually, the relationship goes into uh, insufficient funds. And so this is important for us to see that we need to meet the needs of other people. So um, how do we know what their needs are? That's point number three. You learn what your spouse needs by listening. Have you ever noticed how much the book of Proverbs says about listening? This must be something that centuries ago people understood is the kind of thing that we just don't tend to have a natural instinct to do, to really listen. Like, for example, Proverbs 18.2, a fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. A fool is a person who has an open mouth and a closed mind. And imagine if you were to go to a doctor someday and you were to sit down and the doctor walks in and without asking you how you feel, without asking you what your symptoms are, without doing any exam or taking any tests, says, okay, here, I've written a prescription for you. That would be crazy. Who would take that prescription before they've even bothered to take the time to find out what your condition is? 
But how many times in our relationships do we write prescriptions to each other before we've ever even stopped to ask, how are you? How are you doing? What do you need? How can I meet that need? And so the Proverbs here warns us that it is foolish to be a person who only talks and never listens. Later, verse 13 says, if one gives an answer before he hears, it is his folly and shame. So what I'm going to suggest to you, if you are married or if you're in a serious dating relationship, that it is good from time to time to sit down. Christy and I would do this, and I would just say to her, would you please tell me what you need that I'm not giving you? So I know, and I can give it to you. And she would do the same thing for me. It doesn't work if you sit down and you say to them, okay, let me tell you what you really need. That one doesn't work. The one that works is to say, I want to know. What do you need? How can I please you? Tell me how I can give you what you need. That's what love is all about. Proverbs 20 verse 5 says, The purpose in a man's heart is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. It is not easy to understand one another. And the longer you're married the more you have these experiences where you say things like, I don't even know who you are. Because sometimes it is difficult to really understand what each other is thinking. I will tell you a simple illustration of this. When I'm up here preaching, and I look out at your faces, I have no idea what most of you are thinking. And some of you have what they call resting faces. I remember once I was preaching in a meeting, it was down in southeast Texas, And there was this guy in the congregation listening to my sermon, and the look on his face I can only describe as a mix of profound disgust and sheer hatred. It's what he looked like. And all night long, he sat over in this general area. Ron, you have a very pleasant face, but imagine somebody sitting where Ron is, and looks like he's ready to kill me. And I thought, okay, after the lesson, I didn't even want to talk to this guy. I was no telling what he was going to say. But then finally, I decided, okay, man up and go to him. Find out what the beef is, and let's deal with it. I go over to him, and he goes, hey, i got to tell you, that was one of the best lessons I've ever heard. That makes no sense! <laughs> but that's the point. And in our relationships, we can never assume that we really understand what the other person is. A man of understanding draws it out so that they truly seek to understand their spouse. Now, obviously, this goes for all of us in all of our relationships. But I think it goes to marriage especially, and quite frankly, to husbands particularly. Not because it is not important for a wife not to understand her husband, but rather because my experience has been that we men tend to generally be less cognizant of the needs of our wives more so than they are of ours. And I think there might even be biblical warrant to this point. In 1 Peter chapter 3, when Peter gives instructions to wives and husbands, this is a passage I'm going to talk about tonight in the eulogy, It's interesting to me that he doesn't ask wives to live with their husbands in an understanding way, but he does ask it of husbands to live with their wives in an understanding way. Or as the NIV says, to be considerate of your wives. Because it is very easy for us, by virtue of our size and our strength, to run roughshod over our wives. And so we must be especially considerate of them to know what they truly need, and then to offer it to them in the currency that has purchased for them rather than us. So, ask each other what you need. Do it regularly. And do it selflessly, not self-defensively. Because the tendency is going to be, when you are a sincere spouse, truly trying to meet the needs of your spouse, and you ask them the question, what do you need that I'm not giving you? And they tell you to take a, well, I I don't understand. I thought it was, that's not the point. If they don't perceive that you're doing it, it's not being done. So don't be self-defensive. Remember what Paul said in Philippians 2. Look not to your own interest. This is not about you. This is about pleasing the need of your spouse. And then listen regularly and listen selflessly and then listen sympathetically. 
I'm going to talk about this passage as well tonight about Patty. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. What do I mean by listen sympathetically? I mean this. Don't just simply hear words. And don't just simply analyze ideas. Feel what they're feeling sympathetically. Let me ask one of the veterans around here. Wade, has enough time transpired that we've got enough new people that I can tell the CPAP story? Okay, Wade, Wade has given me, some of you heard this story, some of you haven't. Here's my best story on this point. So I have sleep apnea. So when I sleep at night, I'm more machine than man. I have to put this uh, thing over my face that blows air through, helps to keep my throat open. And I've had this machine for, uh, wow, well, going on uh, nine years now, long before Christy and I even started dating. And uh, 19 years, actually, now that I think about it, man, I lost a whole decade there, Rob. That's pretty bad, isn't it? <laughs> Whew, I better wrap this thing up and get out of here. So anyway, and so 19 years, when I first got this machine, the nurse said, now you got to clean this thing out. So the easiest way to do this is run soap and water in your kitchen, run the tubing through there, and then just sling it around a few times. It gets the water right out of there. Sounds great to me. Every boy wants to be a cowboy. So for years, run it through the water, get it out, sling it around, good to go. And then Christy and I got married, and I moved into her house. And I would still do it. That's how I would clean my machine. She's usually gone during the day at work, so that's when I go in the kitchen, fill up the sink, soap and water, run the tubing through it, sling it around, and no, no problem. Until one day she happened to be off work. And she happened to walk into the kitchen right as I was in mid-sling in Roy Rogers fashion. And she said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm just drying out my CPAP thing here. You're slinging water everywhere in the kitchen. So what? It's just water. It leaves spots. Spots? What are you talking about? It leaves little white spots. That's the craziest thing over there. And besides that, you're going to ruin the Venetian plaster by the sink. What do you mean Venetian plaster by the sink? It's Venetian plaster. It can't get wet. If it can't get wet, why did you put it by the sink? She goes, you don't care because you've always just lived in a crummy apartment. So, see, now we're bobbing and weaving here. This is, this is getting good. So then, finally, I realized she was off that day, and Christy was a meticulous uh, housekeeper, and she had deep cleaned the whole house, including the kitchen. And so here on her day off, she has worked hard to clean this house, and she walks into the kitchen and sees her idiot husband creating white spots all over our dark uh, uh, countertop. And aside from the virtues of the wonderful case we were making to each other, the point is I didn't even think about how this would come across to her until I could see the frustration in her eyes of, I can't believe you're doing this the one day I have off and I try to get things to look good and you're doing this. And then I felt what she was feeling. And by the way, I just want to say, even though it's been almost three years since she's been gone, and even though I really want to, I still don't do it in the kitchen anymore. So uh, if my lovely wife still knows what's going on, she should be well pleased about that. Well, the point I'm making to you is, what was important in that exchange was not the words and not the ideas, it was feeling. Feeling the world as she felt it. Seeing the world from her perspective. That's really the key for all of us good brothers and sisters. If we're going to get along with each other, we have to have hearts that are open to one another's hearts to do what this passage describes. And then we can learn how to navigate these disputes in a way that truly satisfies one another's needs. I mentioned to you last week that one of the grave challenges facing marriage in America is our radical individualism. We don't want to think about anybody else's rights or needs but ours as a culture. And we have to be countercultural. 
one of my mentors put me onto this book, which is one of the best books I've ever read about marriage, called His Needs, Her Needs. And in the course of this book, the author says this, I believe our society's failure to train people in meeting the needs of others, especially the needs of a marriage partner, has caused much of our high divorce rate. As long as we fail to see marriage as a complex relationship that requires special training and abilities to meet the needs of a member of the opposite sex, we will continue to see a discouraging and devastating divorce rate. I think he's absolutely right. I was supposed to be up in Kentucky preaching today near my hometown, but because of Patty's service, which I definitely wanted to be at, I'm going to wait to go up tomorrow to start that meeting. I'll be just a few miles from my hometown, and so whenever I go up home, I always think about my mom and my granny and my pop. I'm not sure if I've ever shown you all this picture before. This is in the house I grew up in in Winchester. Pop and granny were married for 61 years. Most of those years were not very easy at all. And a lot of it was my pop's fault. He had a lot of faults. And my granny paid a steep price for those faults. But my pop turned his heart back to the Lord in the final years of his life. Granny once told me he was as fine a husband as I could have ever asked for at that point. Their relationship sweetened. And when pop was slowly fading away, we had to set up a hospital bed at the house for him. It was in 1992, it was the summer, which of course was an Olympics year. And Pop was delirious most of the time. We did, we brought a TV in <clears throat> for the people who were sitting with him to be able to watch. And one day while the gymnastics floor routine was on television, Pop kind of looked up and opened his eyes and he looked at Granny and he looked at the gymnasts And then he said, I'd like to see my granny sashay across the floor like that, (laughs) which was funny for many reasons for all of us. But it was sweet. His heart was failing, and his mind was fading. But when he needed her most, she was there, and she was my granny. Granny stuck it out, they stuck it out, and by the Lord's grace, they made it through. So when I tell you that marriage is a model of God's power to reconcile sinners, I'm not speaking in the abstract. I'm talking about Granny and Pop and many other stories just like it. And this story is ultimately, as Andrew talked about, it's a story of love. It's a story that we've all been invited to. And this morning, if you need to make some response in your life to the offer that Jesus Christ has given us on the cross, either to become a Christian through faith and baptism into him, or to be the kind of person that loves and gives and meets needs of your spouse and others, why don't you let us know how we can help you while we stand and sing.